and Egypt on Monday. Okay, yeah. wow. For a tour, oh yeah. Uh, just for a week of I've met various meetings and, and so on. I'm, I'm going down with uh, Ilona Tassiot to visit the German excavations there that she's been involved in. So, um, But just, yeah, I'm not digging there anymore, so just to see the minister and, you know, and yeah. meetings and I stuff. I had so. to do that in two weeks. Okay. He's very good. Uh, yes, but I can't solve because I can't write yeah, yeah. So I had to... Well, let's switch to English, and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Neil Spencer. Well, of course, uh, Dr. Spencer doesn't need a presentation. He's well known to all of you, I suppose, uh, as keeper of the British Museum. Uh, but tonight, and also is very involved with our museum because it's part on our, uh, of our advisory um, committee, together with other members, which I'm very pleased to welcome here today, and then um, with uh, Mary Christina Bidotti, Rita Fried, Dume Tampler, and Helen Katzinger, which I'm very pleased that they're here tonight. And they're also visible to all of you because they do a lot of work for our museum and supporting our research, so it's nice that they can also be visible to our public. And they will all be involved in uh, giving us lectures. And uh, Neil is uh, the first one who kindly accepted to um, give a lecture. And he will present us uh, the results of his excavation in Amara West. One of our curators, uh, Paolo de Vesco, was also there. So uh, there is also a little link with uh, uh, scientific stuff here. So they're all willing to listen to your lecture, Neil. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Christian, and to the, the museum and the Fondazione for this uh, very kind uh, invitation. It's wonderful to be, to be speaking in such a temple of Egyptology with such a great history uh, of research and, of course, the collections that are just outside and that will be redisplayed from, from next year. So I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to be here. And I should say buonasera, and that's the last bit of Italian you'll hear uh, for the next hour. I'm very sorry, my, my Italian is not good enough. Um, so I'm going to take you to, to Nubia, in fact, to modern-day northern Sudan, um, and talk about the work the British Museum has been doing uh, since uh, 2008 uh, with renewed excavations uh, at this site. Um, so just to put everyone in the picture uh, of where we are, um, we're in uh, northern Sudan, uh, just downstream from the Third Nile Cataract. Um, so this is about 170 kilometers upstream uh, from uh, Abu Simbel uh, and famous temples uh, of Ramses II. Um, now, just a very brief uh, history lesson, although I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this uh, already. Um, of course, uh, this is an area that was uh, under the, the rule of the great kingdom of Karma. Um, well, you'll all know the, the, the great monuments, such as the, the Dufufa, this great temple at Karma. Um, this was a state that uh, ruled a large part of the Middle Nile Valley, um, and we now know that also uh, undertook raids into southern Egypt uh, during the Second Intermediate Period. Um, and we know from texts such as the Kamose Stela that, that there was attempted alliances between the Hyksos in the north uh, and the Nubian polity of Karma in the south to try and squeeze the Theban state. Um, so, Karma was eventually uh, reconquered by the pharaohs of the early, uh, early 18th dynasty. Um, there were campaigns under Kamose, uh, then in, into Ahmose, um, and then particularly on, under the reign of Tutmosis I, um, there seems to have been uh, a complete control taken of this area uh, by the pharaonic state. Um, now, there are inscriptions of Tutmosis I, uh, of Tutmosis I as far upstream as Kurgus, uh, near the fifth cataract, um, but 
in particular, around this time, there was a policy of founding towns uh, throughout uh, the Nubian Nile Valley uh, to really uh, ensure the domination in terms of political control, military control, but of course also economic control of the region by the pharaonic state. So you have the foundation of uh, towns at Sai. Um, this is the uh, statue of Amenhotep I that's been found there. Uh, but also, uh, increasingly, there's evidence of early 18th dynasty uh, activity at places like um, uh, Tombos, but also Sesebe um, and uh, further to the south. Um, so that's in around 1500 BC, the reconquest uh, of this area by the pharaonic uh, state. Um, in addition to the uh, rock inscriptions of uh, Tutmosis I at places like Tombos and Kurgus, you have this uh, foundation of settlements. Um, but I think one of the themes that I'm going to try and come back to again and again tonight um, is moving away from the Egyptian inscriptions and what they tell us, and actually using archaeology uh, to try and inform us about what life was actually like in these places, and how much of an impact did Egypt actually have uh, in, the, in the Middle Nile Valley. So there was the creation of these towns, but the people who are living there already, uh, just because they're under a different political authority, how much did life actually change? Um, increasingly, survey in this region is beginning to show that some of the Kerma settlements weren't much affected at all, particularly the, the rural ones in the Dongola Reach. Um, so I'll come back to that theme a bit uh, throughout the lecture, the idea of moving away from the historical, very biased Egyptian sources um, to use archaeological evidence to, to find out what it was actually like to live in pharaonic Nubia um, during the late second millennium uh, BC. This is the type of evidence we're all used to. Um, it's the depiction of the uh, victorious Egyptian armies. Um, this is a, a scene of uh, Ramses II at Beit el Wali, um, conquering the chaotic Nubians. And then the depiction of the Nubians as, as prisoners bound completely under the control of Egypt. Uh, Egypt described this area as vile Kush or wretched Kush. Um, and then you have uh, tomb scenes and temple scenes of Nubians coming, offering tribute to Pharaoh. So what we're trying to do is move away from that and look at the archaeological evidence to find out what it was like to live in, these, uh, in this part of the world uh, under Pharaonic colonial control in the late second millennium BC. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is our work at Amara West, uh, which was a town that seems to have been founded in the reign of uh, Seti I father of Ramses II, um, in around 1300 BC. But just this January and February, we also did some work beyond the town. We moved into the desert, about two kilometers into the desert. Um, this is a landscape that's changed a lot uh, in the last few millennia. So what you're actually looking at here, Amara West is behind the camera, uh, and we'll come on to that soon. Um, but we're actually looking at an ancient river channel. There's still trees in the desert marking the, 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 uh, the course of this very early Nile channel. What we started looking at this year was a series of sites, uh, two sites on either side of this uh, Nile Channel. Now, we've done dating of the Nile Channel. We know it was flowing during the early New Kingdom. And what was interesting this year is we found evidence in these, these little rocks overlooking this early river that's now dry. And so where Amara West is here, we're up near this early Nile, which no longer flows. We found evidence of uh, Egyptian from around the reigns of Tutmosis I to Tutmosis III. Um, so very distinctive 18th dynasty pottery, a very unusual stone seal with the, the name Amenhotep. And then it seems to stop around the reign of Tutmosis in the desert here. I really just throw this out there to, to the Nile. Um, but also, how did the foundation of towns affect what was happening? in the So when Amara West was founded around 1300 BC, this area had been under Egyptian control nearly 200 years the foundation of a new town affect what was going out on the desert? Is it because of that, that this, small settlements stopped, they, they ceased to, to, to be needed? Um, and those are just questions we're beginning to answer, and we don't have any answers yet. Uh, we're just beginning to realize that there is activity of early New Kingdom date out in the desert. Uh, one of the other things uh, we did this year uh, is the uh, outcrop town. Again, we're about two kilometers north of Amara West into the desert here. Um, there's this rocky outcrop that's got a whole series of uh, rock art uh, drawings on it, typically of, of cattle uh, and other animals. You can see one of them here. Um, these are probably much earlier in date, uh, maybe prehistoric or, or, or early karma. Um, it's the kind of rock drawings you find throughout the Nubian uh, Nile Valley. Um, but interestingly here, uh, an Egyptian official, uh, a scribe of the temple named Hatiai, has carved over uh, the earlier cow depictions. And this is something that's a recurring theme throughout the Egyptian 
entanglement with Nubia and the New Kingdom, uh, the placing of Egyptian inscriptions, the placing of Egyptian towns, and also cemeteries in places where there was Nubian activity before. So it's a, it's a, really, it's, it's a physical imprint being placed onto the landscape, really underlining that uh, colonial control. So there's activity out in the desert, and I just wanted to show you that to place Amara West in its, in its wider context. And I'll come back to the rivers a bit later, as that's, that's quite a So this is what Amara West looks like today. Um, so um, it's, it's a very beautiful site. Um, conditions aren't always easy, and I'll come back to that later. Um, it's the Nile here makes a big turn. Um, Sai Island is a, a, on, a, on the a top left of the picture, around the corner. <coughs> The Nile turns east here, um, so Amara West is not really Amara West, it's Amara North, it's on the north side of it. Um, it's called West because it's, it's local West uh, in regards to the river. Um, and the site is very well preserved um, because in this area, north of the, of the river, um, there's almost no modern development. In fact, there hasn't been settlement in this area um, since about the third, uh, sorry, fourth, third century BC. Um, all the settlement's been on the other side, and I'll come back to that later. Um, Without uh, um, the river flowed around the site here, once that dried up, the, sand, the, 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 city, sorry, the ancient town became covered with sand uh, very quickly. And it's that sand that protects the town uh, and has, uh, has led to the pristine uh, preservation of the uh, architecture. So what you're looking at here is the town, uh, some of our excavations, and there was a river channel around here, which I'll come back to uh, later. The, the island uh, up here, Erneta, is actually where we live. Um, we live in a traditional Nubian village on the island. But I just ask you to bear it in mind because it probably looks a little bit like Amara West once did. So an island in the Nile with a small channel around it. So just, just bear that in mind uh, as I'm speaking. It's not always plain sailing at Amara West. It's a very difficult place to work. Um, so uh, we're, um, well... Every kind of condition you can imagine is thrown at us. It's freezing in the morning. It's very hot uh, by lunchtime. Uh, two or three times a year, we have to stop work because of the sandstorms. Uh, you can imagine how dispiriting it is to excavate a room and come back the next day and it's full of sand. Um, we have crocodiles, which are beautiful but dangerous, so there's no swimming. Um, and you can see us warming our hands by fire one early morning as the sun comes up on site. So very difficult conditions. Um, and I, I didn't even mention the biting flies that plague us. But anyway, um, very difficult conditions. But it all helps the preservation of the archaeology. Um, and I should just say before we go on, our work is, is very collaborative, in particular with our colleagues from the National Corporation of Antiquities and Museums uh, in Khartoum, who, who give us the excavation permit, uh, but also uh, colleagues come and join the excavations, such as our, our inspector, Shadia Abdu Rabo, who's been with us since the start. Um, so, that, so I'm going to show you lots of pictures of nice sunny buildings, but it's not always easy on site when we're working there. And we work every January, February, and sometimes into March and places like that. Um, the, t the wall town is only about 100, 108 metres on either side. Um, so it's, it's relatively compact, um, which gives us a chance to excavate quite a large proportion of it, which is unusual in, in modern excavations. So as I said, we're not the first people to work there. Um, in fact, there's a, a longer uh, history of British engagement at Amara West. So in the winter of 1938-39, H.W. Uh, uh, Fairman was excavating at Sesebe on behalf of the Egypt Exploration Society, 80 kilometers to the south. Um, and they came to Amara West and did a few uh, a short season, uncovering parts of the Temple of Ramses II. Um, and then they came back for four more seasons, one before the Second World War and then three in the late 1940s. Um, and actually, there's, an old, there's a British Museum link here as well, um, because one of the people in this picture is, uh, is uh, Yestin Edwards, who then came on, went on to be the keeper of Egyptian antiquities uh, in the British Museum. So the museum's had a long history of engagement here. Um, they used Egyptian foremen, Rais, uh, to d direct the work, um, and then local, uh, local workers, as was the norm at the time. Um, they excavated parts of the temple that had already been seen by Wallace Budge and James Henry Breasted and F.W. Green in the very early 20th century. Um, the temple is one of the best preserved Ramesside temples anywhere outside of Luxor. So it's standing to 2.2 meters high, uh, carved out, uh, uh, built from sandstone. Uh, when it was first uncovered, it had remnants of uh, painted reliefs and even gilding on some of the reliefs. Um, and uh, it was decorated in the reign of Ramses II, but all the way through until the reign of uh, Ramses IX. It has the latest uh, royal inscription in Upper Nubia known to date. Um, so the temple's very well preserved, um, and they also excavated part of uh, a residential building, 
which had a series of door jams and door lintels in it, mentioning holders of the title, the Idnu and Kush, the deputy of Kush. And this led to the interpretation of the site, very reasonably, as the administrative center uh, of Upper Nubia, or Kush, under the Egyptian uh, control of the, of the Ramesside period. Um, so the king appointed a viceroy uh, of Nubia, a king's son of Kush, and under him there was one for Lower Nubia, Northern Nubia, or Wawat, and one for Upper Nubia. And it seems this was founded as a new center for the control uh, of this region uh, in the reign of Seti I. Now, the, the excavations of the 1930s and 40s were very good a quality for their day, but they very much focused on architecture, inscriptions. They weren't interested in things like ovens and floor deposits and geochemical samples, which I will come on to later. Um, but they did show the value of the site for looking at uh, domestic architecture, showed the preservation of it and the potential for, for further research. So our work has particularly focused on the living areas, so the, the, the houses, the normal houses, some very small, some large villas, um, to try and get a sense of lived experience. But we do come across aspects of this pharaonic control and the, the, this kind of uh, large pharaonic bureaucracy, administrative apparatus that was running Nubia. Um, so we find lots of seal impressions, presumably associated with storage magazines, uh, with boxes containing uh, things deemed to be of value. Um, we also find a small number of inscriptions, a very small number of inscriptions, uh, often reused, that refer to people with administrative titles. Um, so this uh, gentleman here was uh, an overseer of the double granary named Horhotep, um, presumably uh, one of the uh, earlier residents at the site associated with some of the storage buildings. I'll come on to in a moment. Um, We've also find, we also find aspects of uh, or, uh, expressions of elite Egyptian culture, as you might find in Egypt at this period. So in 2009, we discovered uh, a copy of the teaching of Amenemhat, um, which was kindly identified by my former colleague, Richard Parkinson. Um, this seems to have been the first literary text, uh, Egyptian literary text, identified outside Egypt proper. It's not actually surprising that elite scribal culture was being practiced beyond Egypt's borders, but it's nice to have confirmation of it. And several further copies of the teaching of Amenemhat have now turned up at Amara West um, through looking at the old EES objects. They weren't identified uh, at the time. Um, so you have these expressions of elite Egyptian culture. But one of the big questions that we're still trying to resolve at the site is when the, the site was founded as a planned town, this square outline, a lot of it's given over to storage magazines, uh, to the temple, to the official residence. Where are the people's houses? I mean, there's, there's hardly any space for any houses. There's one small area we've identified a series of of, of buildings which might be very small houses um, side by side, but we're, it's, not, it's not even clear at present. We're missing the kind of uh, planned rows of houses such as you have at places like the Workman's Village, Daryl Medina, but particularly also you have it at places like Sesebe, um, uh in the later 18th dynasty. We don't have any of that, so it seems to be a place when it's founded, it didn't have much of a population, or it wasn't intended to have much of a population. So that's one of the, the enigmas about the site still. There doesn't seem to be enough space for housing in, the, in its initial form. But one of the things we're finding working at Amara West is we need to stop characterizing these towns as all being the same. So Sesebe, Amara West, Sai, they all had very different functions developed differently and responded differently to their local climate, uh, lo sorry, local environment. And we're finding at Amara West that it's occupied for about 200 years, so from the reign of Seti I until the end of the uh, New Kingdom. It seems to change quite a lot during that period. So initially, you have very few houses, you have a lot of storage facilities, official buildings. Within a generation or two, a lot of those storage buildings are being uh, demolished and people are building houses. And there's a sense of people building and, and planning their own houses or, or the community self-organizing. It, it doesn't seem like a planned community like so common at some other Egyptian towns. So it's very much a place that's changing over time, which you might expect. I mean, no, no city or, or town stands still. But I think as Egyptologists, we often characterize a town in one way and, then, and, and, and leave that label stuck to it. So it's a place that's changing. At the start, we have these large storage magazines with vaulted roofs. You'll have seen them at places like the Ramesseum. We have Ostraca that talk about commodity deliveries. And I have to thank here Rob Demaray, who's been working on our Ostraca for us. Um, and then that changes quite quickly. So here, here's a magazine wall. So this is a, a 80 centimeter thick wall standing two meters high that someone's gone to the trouble of, of demolishing until it's flat and then building a house on top of it. Um, they were obviously weren't happy using the magazine-like spaces uh, as spaces to live in. 
Um, so the, the, the place is changing. We also have, it seems, um, areas of outside space within the walled town. So uh, just this last year, one of my colleagues, Anna Stevens, was working outside one of those houses and found a whole series of spaces with these curved walls that almost seem to be delimiting maybe outside space or the backyard of houses. And the deposits in these spaces are not occupation deposits like you find in the t in the inside the houses. Um, rather, they're very fine windblown silts like you'd expect in a, in a backyard or a garden. You can see here one of the problems we're dealing with is the architecture is so well preserved that as we don't remove anything, the, the, the window we have into the early phases gets smaller and smaller. We're not removing any architecture unless, we're, unless we have to remove it for health and safety uh, reasons. And this area that we've been excavating over the last uh, seven or eight years now um, is just north of the deputy's residence, which is down here. Um, and it's a series uh, of, um, there's up to eight houses eventually in this area. It was once all storage magazines, um, and then it became a series of uh, individual houses. So there's a house here with a door off the street, another one here, another one here, another one down here, and then three houses up there and another one over here. One of the magazines, the storage magazines, was never reused as part of a house. It's, it, it became like the village, village rubbish dump. People were just throwing stuff there for the rest of the history of the town. Um, these houses are fairly modest, so they're between 150 and 400 square meters at the, at the top end. Um, relatively typical for what you find in Egypt this period, lots of parallels to Amarna, but also lots of differences. So this is a typical house, front door leading off the street, you've got a, a cross room with a hearth or a cooking place, small uh, middle room, a room with a staircase, and then a back room with the mastaba on the back wall and a, and a private room off to the back. Um, the fact the staircases are gone, uh, sorry, the fact the staircases are there remind us how much is missing. So we can talk about the houses and how they develop, but we're missing at least half of them, uh, what was above uh, either on the roof or in a, in a first story. Um, these houses are built of mud brick, as is common in Egyptian houses, but with stone architectural elements, typically door jams, uh, door lintels, door thresholds. Um, the stone at Amara West is very, very bad quality. It's very white sandstone that powders away when you touch it. Um, so very few of them have inscriptions. They, they were originally plastered with inscriptions, but the plaster doesn't usually survive. We did find one very nice uh, door that we could reconstruct, and the, the quality of the stone at the top was so good, we think it was actually from Sai and, uh, and brought from just around the corner. Sai was a famous sandstone quarry. Even uh, the Egyptians recognized the quality of the, of the sandstone from the site. Um, but this was very unusual because um, the uh, inscription on this door, uh, it refers to, uh, to two gods. It refers to a form of Amun-Ra um, and a form of uh, Horus, Alceti, Lord of Nubia. But what's really interesting is you can just about see on the, on the, on the far left, there's a reference to the royal, royal Ka of Menchepera, so Tutmosis III. Now, of course, Tutmosis III was one of the, the revered uh, conqueror kings, uh, like Samosra III in, in Nubia. Um, it's very interesting. I mean, is this a monument that's been taken from Sai and, and erected carefully in someone's house? Uh, or was the inscription done uh, at Amara West? Why do you have a reference to a royal car in a private house? Um, it throws up lots of interesting, uh, interesting questions. Again, another expression of elite uh, um, uh, Egyptian culture, uh, very formal Egyptian culture, even within a domestic environment. Um, as I said, we have very few names from Amara West. We know the names of some of the deputies. Um, the cemetery has provided not one name, um, either our excavations or the previous ones. Um, but rather, um, uh, we just have a few names. I mentioned Horhotep earlier. Um, and this is a, a, door, um, a door lintel reused as a door blocking uh, in a house um, that has a really nice little depiction of a, a seated lady. Um, and her, um, her name seems to be the lady of the house, uh, Ichet. Um, she was perhaps uh, uh, sitting behind her husband. Um, but what, there's a lovely detail, um, a small, small prancing uh, monkey. Um, so we don't often get things that you would see displayed in a museum during our excavation. So it's nice when we, we can put a name to some of the people uh, that, were, uh, that were originally living. However, I think what the site shows us is how much we can do with archaeology, even if we don't have the text uh, and the names because of uh, marriage, divorce, in-laws moving in. We, we can only speculate. Um, but um, it shows that these places are being changed by individuals, not, not by the state. This is very much a, a self-organizing uh, community. Now, the other place we've been looking at is beyond uh, neighborhood E13, uh, which is down here. 
And we've been looking at this, um, uh, this suburb, as it were. So this is an extramural suburb built outside the town wall and seemingly quite late in the history of the town, so around the uh, late 19th, early 20th dynasty. The fact, it's, uh, fact people are building houses outside the wall, of course, indicates the wall no longer had a defensive function, if it ever did. And you can see here, this is a three-dimensional reconstruction uh, based on kite and uh, uh, photogrammetry uh, photographs. Um, I'm just going to walk you through one of the houses to give you an idea of the space. Um, so the house had an outside space in the front um, that seems to have been a later addition, almost like a porch. Um, these walls are walls that the inhabitants were building to block the sand that was beginning to build up outside the, the houses. This room had a nice brick floor, um, so it was kind of a formal entrance space. And then off to one side, you had a room where we found lots of layers of animal dung, so presumably they were keeping livestock here. And as is typical at houses at Amara West, there's always a room with three or maybe more ovens. So these are, are, are bread ovens, uh, but it could have also been used to make pottery figurines and so on. Um, as you can see, the architecture is quite well preserved in this case, to about a meter. Um, you then go into the, the main middle room of the house, which doesn't seem to have ever had a roof um, and didn't have a nice brick floor. Um, and this room seems to have sat next to a staircase. Now, we think there was a staircase here. As you can see, there's only a big pit now. Um, so some point, perhaps in the late 19th, early 20th century, the brickwork of the staircase has been extracted to make new bricks with. And then you go into the central room of the house, uh, which has a hearth, uh, a cooking place at its center, has a mastaba uh, at the back, that kind of formal reception space you get in Egyptian houses. And then interestingly, in all of our houses, we have what we call the back room. Uh, this house has two back rooms, one there and one on the other side that you'll see in a moment. And these rooms never had nicely laid floors. They were the most private spaces in the house, but also perhaps the spaces you put rubbish and you swept things into. Um, so you can see the two back rooms here. And this house was built um, outside a large villa, which is down here, and later another house was built in between. And you can just about see the outline of all the houses that we've, we've yet to excavate. Um, and I, I, I should probably, being in Turin at this point, say thank you to Paolo del Vesco sitting here who spent many weeks planning the surface architecture uh, for us during uh, January and February. So we still to go back there um, next January. Um, but it's very interesting, again, to see how people are organizing their houses and, uh, and their domestic spaces differently outside the town walls compared to inside uh, the town walls, which were, where there was a lot less space. So let's see if this moves on. Yeah. One of the interesting things in the house I just showed you was in two of the doorways, um, they'd cut little holes right into the thickness of the doorway and buried these, uh, these small, um, small jars. Um, as is typical in archaeology, um, it might seem exciting, and then you empty them, it's just full of sand, there's nothing in them. So why were they being buried in, in, in these doorways? It's an, an enigma to us. And then one of the really strange things in this house was we, and the house next door was we found a whole series of... Um, impressions of ceilings um, so, or, or of stamps. But stamp impressions are usually small scarab sized. You know, they're two to three centimeters long. Um, as you can see, these are up to eight, nine centimeters long. So they're about that long. Um, and one of the, the one on the left seems to have the name of uh, Menmatra. Um, it could be Matkara, but more likely to be Menmatra, so Seti the first. The one on the right, we haven't been able to, to read yet. But the other thing is we don't know what these are for because they seem to have on the back of them the impression of, um, of architecture as if they've been placed into the corner of rooms. So we're not entirely sure of what these are for. And just this year, colleagues, uh, Austrian colleagues at Sai around the corner or just upstream found another similar uh, example. So we've yet to understand exactly what these are, these are for. The, the, the suburb was somewhere where people built big houses initially. Um, so the largest house we've excavated, this villa on the left, is 400 square meters in size. So it's up in the top 10% of houses that you get, say, at Tala La Marna, where there's hundreds of houses. There's a very big data set. And right up in that top 10% are houses of around four or 500 square meters. Now, those are owned by chief of police and high priests and so on. Um, we can't say that for the houses at Amara West. Uh, we're in a very different environment. But whoever was building these houses wanted, wanted to take advantage of the space uh, afforded by moving out of the walled town. What they don't have compared to the Amarna houses is they're not set within precincts with sacred pools and chapels and, and uh, grain silos and so on. Rather, they're very compact. And whether that's to do with the environment and the amount of windblown sand that these people were facing um, is something we can only speculate about. 
just to quickly go through the house, you have a porch, you come into an open courtyard, you have a cooking suite down to the bottom left, to the southwest, you have that central room with a staircase, and then at the back, where it's nice and brick paved, uh, you have a room with a master bar and a bed niche, or a bed alcove, in the, in the room to the top left. Just to the south, a couple of years ago, we excavated another villa, um, not as well preserved, but similar ideas. Entrance at the north, um, courtyard, uh, special area for cooking and storage of grain. Um, and then you can see that the, that the southern end has been very badly damaged by digging for, for mud and, uh, and mud brick material. So these seem to be the earliest houses at the si uh, in, the, in the suburb, and then they're infilled with the kind of smaller houses I was just showing you. So we're trying to research how a neighborhood develops over, over a few generations. Now, as I said, um, most of the houses have staircases, um, and termites are a big problem, both in the, the village we live in, but also on the ancient site. So almost no wood, papyrus, um, uh, or matting, or other organic material survives. A little bit in the cemetery, but not in the town. Um, and so what we're, but, but, but fortunately, um, we do have a lot of evidence for how the roofs were built. So the roofs seem to have been built in a way that's been used until relatively recently in, in this part of the world. Um, so uh, using wooden beams and poles, then layers of matting and grass over the top, and then you put mud over the top of that. Um, everything's been eaten away by termites apart from the mud, uh, but the mud has very nice impressions uh, of the bundles of grass, of the nice woven mats and so on that were placed there. So uh, my colleague, Marie van den Busch, has been doing uh, a very in-depth study of these roofs, and we can start to understand spaces that were roofed for shelter, spaces that were roofed to support activity above, spaces that weren't roofed, uh, and so on. But we don't have any clear evidence yet whether there were built upper stories. We, we know the structures could have supported them, but we haven't found anything like, say, column bases fallen from the story uh, above, as found at Amarna. Um, but it does remind us of, of what's missing. And, of course, the fact that we're missing um, uh, wood and uh, textiles is also removing a lot of the texture and color that there may have been in these houses. So we get a very kind of brown drab sense. Some of the walls are painted, sometimes red, yellow, uh, whitewashed. Uh, but we're missing a lot of the, a lot of the kind of ambiance of these houses. Uh, we can't reconstruct that. Um, the objects we find tell us a lot about the, the lives of individuals, uh, sorry, the lives of the people living there. Um, so as you might expect, we find a lot of beads, um, occasionally with carnelian, gold and so on, but often faience, shell, ostrich egg shell. Um, occasionally we find fittings. Um, I have to admit, we don't know exactly what this is on the left. It's a burnt bone uh, fitting. We think it's a brooch of some sort, maybe for sewing onto a textile or a garment. We, we don't really know. Um, we haven't found a good parallel yet, so it, it might be that this speaks to a more Nubian uh, material culture tradition, perhaps. Um, we find scarabs. Um, so these are uh, the, uh, the objects that were both amuletic, but are also used for sealing. And what's quite nice is we find scarabs, and we also find the seal impressions from those, or the stamp impressions from those scarabs. Um, so a nice example here um, uh, with the name of Tutmosis III, um, but they often have God's names on them and, and so on. What you'd expect in, a, in a, a town of this period in Egypt, in fact. One of our most exciting finds uh, was the discovery of a, an anthropoid bust, uh, what Egyptologists often call an ancestor bust, um, still sitting in situ uh, in the back room of a house. Now, I told you about the, the house that was divided in two. We're, we're in that house. And you can just, it's been turned into a four-roomed corridor-like house. And right in the back room, sitting on a, on a brick pedestal about this high off the floor, uh, was this uh, painted anthropoid bust. It's about 42 centimeters high, with a black bag wig, no name inscribed on it, as is usually the case. Um, what's really interesting about this bust is, um, I mean, it can be quite closely dated. Um, there was a scarab of Ramses III buried in the floor underneath the pedestal, so it's Ramses III or later. Um, and... Most of these have been found at Daryl Medina, and most of them not in context. Most of them were found in the Great Pit and so on. Um, so it's nice to find one actually in situ in a house. Um, but what's particularly interesting is that um, the, the doorway into that back room where the, the bust was set up was then blocked up um, while the house was still in use and before the roof had collapsed. Um, it looks like this from inside that room, but if you were a visitor to that house, the wall is all nicely plastered and whitewashed, so you'd have no idea there was another room beyond. So... We can only speculate as to why one would block up a room, particularly with a, with a cult image still lying in there. Did the people who move in not have any need for such a cult image? I mean, the, we, we can only speculate, as I say. But it's nice to find such an, an example of household cult actually still in situ. 
Other aspects of household cult, we find a whole series of small stele. These are about this high, uh, very crudely carved. This depicts a woman in front of a, a god or goddess. Um, and then one of our most intriguing finds was um, right directly over a mastaba that had been destroyed, we found hundreds of fragments of molded mud painted in different colors. And you might just be able to see here what you're looking at is a cavetta cornice, that very typical architectural uh, motif used in uh, Egyptian shrines and temples. Um, so you've got the start of the cornice here, torus molding. Uh, sorry, the cornice is up here, cavetta cornice, the torus molding, painted white and red. Other aspects of this decoration in, in yellows, blues, greens, um, some of it in checkerboard pattern, similar to like you find in the workman's village at Amarna. Now, we're archaeologists, but we're also Egyptologists. So when we, when we find a cavity, it's always very tempting to call it a, a cult niche or a shrine. It could, of course, be a cupboard. Um, but uh, we're tempted to think that this probably had some kind of cult function, given the care that was taken uh, in molding the mud into the form of, a, of temple architecture. Um, it was also a focal point of the house uh, over the mastaba on the back wall. And it had been replastered and repainted at least four times. So it was taken care of. Was this, uh, the niche was only up to 25 centimeters deep, so maybe it held a stealer or something. We can, as I said, we can only speculate about that, but th it was clearly a visual focal point uh, within this house. And then most of the objects obviously don't speak to things like cult and belief, but rather everyday concerns such as uh, making things and particularly surviving, making food. Um, so we find uh, things like flint knives, hammer stones, uh, grindstones, uh, bits and pieces of metal, um, the, the kind of the, the toolkit of an ancient Egyptian town. Very similar object range to say what you have at Amarna or uh, Memphis uh, around the same. We do know there was production going on in the town, so this is um, uh, where we found a series of not just bread ovens, but very large kilns set in, uh, set in brick collars. Small, a uh, few fragments of Fios moulds um, suggest there may have been Fios production here, but I wouldn't be sure about that at the moment. Um, but there does seem to have been metal production, maybe not primary metal production, but at least melting down and reforming of metal. Um, we find lots of knives and chisels and so on, but also two of these um, fittings. I'm not sure what they're for, um, whether they're parts of statues or something. It's not clear, but they're very nice copper alloy um, uh, depictions of, uh, of Urea, and you can see the, the detailing uh, on, the, on, the, on the chest of the snake. Um, and then, of course, we're in Nubia, so always in the back of our mind is gold, gold mining, gold extraction, and it's important for the Egyptian economy. Um, Sites like Sesebe are now very explicitly associated with gold through the work of the, the Cambridge Austrian Archaeological Institute mission there, uh, finding quartz workings. At Amara West, there's not really much evidence that people are, are processing gold. We do find a lot of these stones, um, these very uh, di uh, distinctive black grindstones in two forms, and they have these special striations on them. Um, they have been classed as gold gold grinding or quartz grinding uh, implements, but there's, there's not enough of them um, to really suggest it was anything more than a cottage industry. And really, with the quartz deposits being mostly on the other bank of the Nile, how much quartz do you really want to bring over on the boat to an island city every day? Um, it, so it has a sense more of a cottage industry than anything else. Um, in some of the houses, uh, this is a house uh, we dug this year um, with a storage bin, but there was also a very nice assemblage of both Nubian and Egyptian pottery together um, and a kind of toolkit for, for pounding and grinding. It was kind of an anvil-like stone, um, and this actually had uh, remnants of precious metal uh, attached to it as if it had been used uh, in precious metal uh, processing. But again, it feels like a, a cottage industry. Um, Pottery, it seems, was being made at site. Um, this might not seem surprising to you, but when you look at New Kingdom sites in Nubia, um, almost no kilns have been found at all. Um, and some of the other missions working in Nubia have been doing petrograph petrographic and chemical analysis of our pottery. It seems we're building up a consistent picture of quite a lot of our Egyptian-style pottery is being made locally. A few years ago, we found the remains of a kiln uh, built right on the natural uh, island surface. It was a small kiln. It was only about this, this big, um, uh, used for production of pottery, what kind of pottery. But just this year, we found a series of four ostraca uh, that refer to the um, delivery of pottery. Um, so this refers to the delivery of uh, 300 uh, cheb vessels, which is one type of vessel, and another three uh, of a different type of vessel. 
like all these things, it just throws up more questions. Are these being delivered from Egypt, from another site somewhere in, in Nubia, or are they being delivered from one side of the town to another? Um, we don't know. What we do know from the pottery is a lot of pottery is coming in from outside. We have types of pottery that are being and even further beyond. Um, but it does seem clear that both Nubian and Egyptian-style pottery is being made on the site itself. Amara West, at least in its early phase, was very much part of a, a wider empire, Egyptian empire, but also a network of trade. So in our earliest phases, um, so from the time of Ramses II and the, and the 19th dynasty, um, we find a concentration of these Mycenaean stirrup jars. These are luxury items par excellence, used to transport perfume and oils and so on. Um, what's interesting is we've analyzed these uh, using neutron activation analysis at a laboratory in Bonn in Germany. Um, and we can now tell that the fabric is not Egyptian. So these are not imitations made in Egypt, which is a very common uh, phenomenon. But rather, these have been made uh, in one case in Cyprus, which have been made on the Greek mainland. So you think that that's well over a 1,000 kilometers away. So um, Amara West is very much within that network of, of trade in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, in the early Ramesside period. Interestingly, this kind of import stops once we get into the 20th dynasty uh, at the site. Um, and speaking of pottery and the production of pottery, it's, as you might expect, one of the areas we find a lot of evidence about what we would call cultural entanglement. So for a long time, as I said, we followed what the pharaohs said. And we, talk, we thought about wretched Kush and vile Kush and Nubians being completely kind of uh, you know, beneath the boot of the Egyptians, as it were. Um, we're now beginning to think that Egyptianization must have happened, but there must have really been a spectrum of choices people and groups made. Um, and often, the same person could affiliate with Nubia or Egypt in, in a different circumstance, in a different place at a different time. Um, so what we're working with now is this model of a spectrum of, of cultural affiliation where you had Nubians and you had Egyptians and then you had everything in between. Um, and so we're, we're seeing at Amara West that, yes, there's bound to be Egyptianization, um, but there's probably also Nubianization happening. When the town is first founded in 1300 BC, Egypt had controlled this area of the world for 200 years. So what did it mean to be Egyptian or Nubian? And I think these very specific categories don't really help us. Just one example of that from the, from the pottery, and this was, this was work done by Marie Mier a few years ago. This is a great example from the cemetery. On the top is a very typical late new uh, made of Nile silt formed on a wheel. So you can see the, the wheel marks uh, around the outside. On the bottom is a, uh, a vessel that, again, is very typical late New Kingdom, slightly deeper bowl, had rim at the top, but it's been handmade. Um, and the fabric is different also. It's been fired in a different way. You can see that very thick black uh, section to it. And our petrographic analysis is actually showing the Nubian pottery and the Egyptian pottery that looks so different is often made from exactly the same clay mix. So it's actually how it's technologically formed and fired that makes it different, not the actual material. This throws up all sorts of possibilities in terms of the borrowing and sharing of technologies and who, who are making these things. I should say we can't equate pots and people. Just because you've got a Nubian pot in your house doesn't mean you're Nubian in the same way that I might have a piece of German furniture at home, but I'm Irish. Um, so uh, we have to be careful there, but it, it does, pottery does give us insights in the, into these cultural uh, entanglements. Now, the town is overwhelmingly Egyptian. Um, so there's an Egyptian temple. Um, there's the governor's residence. There's all these objects I've been showing you that are very Egyptian. There's Egyptian literature. There's statuary and so on. It was our, great, uh, our greatest surprise in terms of the architecture in 2011, this building uh, here. So you're outside the villa, which is slowly filling up with sand here that we excavated the year before. So this is a villa almost Amarna-like in size and, and layout. And just outside it, and we're, we're just outside the west gate of the town, which is just off the end of the picture here, we found this oval building. Now, of course, you have oval and, uh, and, and circular buildings uh, in Egypt, particularly tree pits and silos and so on. Um, but this wasn't one of those. It was, uh, it was a structure about seven meters across. It had two rooms. So there's an entrance here and another entrance here. It had a very well laid floor. And the, 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 the material makeup of the floor is very different to the type of floors we have in our houses. Um, and then it had a feature against the back wall. It was an L-shaped feature. It may once have been a square feature um, that was uh, black by fire, so that something had been going on there, whether cooking or, or some kind of light industrial activity. Now, I don't know what this building's for. Um, it's 
was quite substantial, so it wasn't just a, a low kind of enclosure for, say, keeping animals or something like that. It, it stood quite high on the basis of all the rubble we found. The pottery, Egyptian 20th dynasty pottery, a few Nubian shards. Um, we don't know what it was, it was for. Is it to do with food processing? Is it a, uh, a small dwelling? Um, is it a ceremonial building? Um, could have been erected quite quickly. Interestingly, there's no column bases or post holes in it, so it would have been very difficult to roof this space um, because of its span. However, is that it, it really doesn't fit within the Egyptian architectural tradition. Rather, it fits very well into the Nubian uh, indigenous architectural tradition. So on a much bigger scale, you've got the Great Hut, uh, La Grande Hut at uh, Kerma, excavated um, by Charles Bonnet. Um, but also in the town at Kerma, you have these much more modest uh, round structures, um, which have been interpreted as dwellings. Um, so it's interesting that right in the middle of an, a very Egyptian town, you've got someone able to, or feels they're able to, build something um, that's not of uh, evident Egyptian appearance. As I said, we'll never know what it's for, and we only have one of them so far. Um, none of these have been found at other Egyptian towns, but I think it's important to recognize that uh, all these Egyptian towns, there's been very little digging outside the walls, and this is just outside the walls. So um, there may be more of them uh, around. They recognize them as karma culture. Who knows? We can only ask these questions. So there's very little in the town that's very explicit about Nubian uh, kind of cultural affiliations. It's very different when we get to the cemetery, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, as you can imagine, uh, food ways, so how people prepare food, present food, uh, the ritual around food is something we're very interested in and is often affected by cultural affiliation. We're on an island, as you might expect. Fishing would have been a, a, a prime uh, activity uh, and source of food. So we find lots of uh, fishing, uh, fishing net weights, also uh, a pot there with an, a depiction of a fish. We don't find the nets and so on, simply because organics don't survive uh, at the site. Um, as well as fish, uh, faunal remains, uh, are, uh, we find them in, in, in vast quantities. And again, I should thank our colleagues in the Antiquities Corporation in Sudan who allow us to export this material for analysis. So we can undertake analysis both in the British Museum and with university partners uh, around the world. Um, the, uh, the animal bone we're finding, I think we're just starting to work on this. The most interesting thing we found so far is there's a lot of reliance on pig in the diet. And when you look at the uh, faunal assemblage at a place like Karma, which is slightly earlier in date, very much Nubian, there's almost no pig. Um, whereas pig is common at New Kingdom sites in Egypt. So again, we seem to have a, a similar picture to what you'd expect in Egypt. And this graph has actually gone a bit funny. It's missing some colors. But what I was trying to show you is that um, uh, there's a reliance on, uh, on barley and emmer wheat, as you might expect at this period in, in New Kingdom Egypt um, and, its, and its colony. Um, but it's interesting. We're finding different reliance, uh, different proportions in different houses. So the big houses rely very heavily on emmer wheat, whereas the small houses, they're relying much more on barley. Um, so we're just beginning to unpick um, uh, these kind of trends between the houses. And again, underlining the individuality of the houses and those who live there. Um, and the charcoal is so important. So uh, my colleague Caroline Cartwright at the British Museum has been working on um, uh, the charcoal that's found in the ovens and so on. Uh, we find pits where they're making charcoal in the houses. Um, and this, of course, can tell us about the, the natural environment around Amara West. So it used to be uh, much, uh, much greener, more fertile than it is today when it was on an island. Um, so what you're looking at there is uh, scanning electron microscope images of, on the left, uh, acacia, uh, and on the right, uh, tamarisk. Uh, so these seem to be the most common fuels. And they seem to be trees that are much more mature than the same species can become in, in today's environment. So this is helping us reconstruct uh, the environment uh, in, in the New Kingdom. Um, but really, in terms, of, um, in terms of understanding what it was like to live, I think it's the cemetery that is telling us the most in some ways. Um, I think often the excavation of towns and cemeteries is done completely separately. Um, and in fact, the idea of settlement archaeology and funerary archaeology being two things is, I think, a problem. Uh, we have to remember it's the people who lived in the towns that were buried in the cemeteries, and the people who lived in the towns made the things and the tombs for the, for the cemeteries. Um, and the, the, the human remains in the cemeteries, of course, are direct evidence. They are uh, the first line of evidence to tell us about what these people, uh, what their health was like, what their diet was like, how long they lived, and so on. 
Um, so we've excavated about 60 tombs, which I'll show you in a moment, um, some of them, but uh, we've got uh, an assemblage of about 250 bodies um, at the moment. Um, they're all skeletonized. We do find remnants of hair, brain, skin, but there, there's no mummified remains. Um, and these individuals uh, and the archaeology around them have been studied by my colleague Michaela Binder, who uh, uh, was based at Durham University. And the, the, the human remains, the, the skeletons, are telling us so much. So just a few kind of snapshots, um, as you might expect. Um, people died early, so most people died by the age of 35 or 40. Uh, we're finding uh, about half of the people are suffering from trauma, so uh, bone fractures. But nearly all of them exhibit healing, um, so the bone fractures have healed. So again, that tells you something about care in the community. So you, the bones can tell you something about what's going on in, the, in those houses. Um, we're finding a lot of, as you might expect, evidence of respiratory disease, uh, arthritis, cardiovascular disease. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a hard life, and the, and the range of injuries and the kind of general level of stress markers is, is similar to what you find in, in pre-modern agricultural uh, societies. Um, one of our most exciting finds in many ways was a, uh, a 20th dynasty uh, individual buried in one of the tombs I'll show you later. Um, and Michaela and colleagues have identified it as a very rare case of uh, metastatic carcinoma. So this is uh, a, uh, probably a case of cancer of the soft tissue, which has then affected the bones. Um, so on the basis of the type of, um, type of uh, holes uh, found throughout the upper body. Um, so it may have been lung cancer or something like that. Cancer, of course, is associated with being a very modern disease, but um, we simply don't look for it often. We don't have the preservation often in the past. And if people are dying by the age of 35, they don't often have the chance to develop cancer, as it were. Um, so it's a very rare example of that. I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are more, uh, more out there. So again, the, the bones are telling us about the lived experience uh, within the town itself. So putting the bones to one side, um, the cemeteries are telling us a lot, of course, about cultural affiliation through the funerary beliefs and the expression uh, uh, through architecture, assemblages, treatment of the dead, and so on. So just to put you in the kind of uh, in context, the town is down here. This is the ancient river channel up here. Um, we've got two cemeteries, uh, six and a half hectares of Cemetery D, which is the elite cemetery where we have pyramid tombs that I'll show you in a moment. And then on this wadi, on the terrace above that wadi, um, there's about uh, two hectares, two and a half hectares of uh, Cemetery C, which has, they're both contemporary, um, and they run from the early 19th dynasty through until beyond the New Kingdom into the 9th, 8th century uh, BC. So just a few images from those cemeteries. Um, Interestingly, in Cemetery D, um, there's a Middle Kingdom, uh, sorry, a Middle Karma burial, okay? So some, from several hundred years before the town was founded. And just next to this tumulus, so it's very typical uh, funerary mound that's a, a very uh, typical form of um, uh, grave architecture in Nubia um, for millennia before and after uh, the New Kingdom. Um, just next to this, someone's built a pyramid chapel in the New Kingdom. So again, you've got that idea of the Egyptian inscription into the landscape on a, on a very physical uh, level. We've only found one Middle, Kerm, middle Kerma tomb so far. Um, there may be more there. This is the kind of thing we find in terms of pyramid chapels. Um, sorry for those of you who are disappointed not to see any pyramids. They've been very badly destroyed and eroded. Um, but what we're looking at is a small brick chapel of about 15 square meters and then with a very, very small pyramid at the back. Um, so generally one to two meters square. Um, these are built of mud brick. Um, the pyramid on the west, as you might expect. Um, this must have been the, the chapel uh, where the cult of the dead was undertaken. And in the, the base of the chapel, um, there's a shaft going up to two meters down into the alluvium, and in some cases into the schist bedrock. And down there, there is one or two chambers generally cut. These are small chambers, um, generally only about a meter high, uh, in which the burials are placed. Um, this is one intact assemblage we found, uh, a man and woman placed in uh, a coffin, a wooden coffin, with an assemblage of pottery. What's quite nice is the wine jar on the left had a hieratic inscription on it referring to uh, wine of three days fermentation from the vineyard of Hormoz. Um, we don't know where that is. Um, uh, and thanks again to Rob Demaray on the inscription. Um, but this is a very typical 19th dynasty assemblage. Um, a scarab with the name of Ramses II. And the only Shabti ever found 
um, in Amara West. And I think you'll all agree, he's not the most pretty Shabti. Um, no inscription on it. Um, uh, that would have been too easy. Um, and that was found in the shaft uh, of this tomb. Um, so generally, it's pottery, some uh, metal artifacts. So you sometimes get mirrors, scarabs, amulets, uh, wooden coffins that have been very badly uh, termite eaten. Um, this, is, this is what the coffins look like today. And when you touch the wood, it often powders into, into tiny bits. But what's quite nice is you find remnants of the plaster and the painted decoration on the coffins. Again, I'm sorry, no hieroglyphs, just uh, often motifs of uh, stripes, yellows, blacks, reds, and so on, on a white ground. Um, and you know, we can often reconstruct the presence of a coffin, but I wouldn't be able to show you a coffin uh, as such. Uh, very badly damaged by termites. We were very lucky in, uh, in a, few year, sorry, a few years ago to find um, a uh, very badly damaged but intact uh, upper part uh, of a coffin uh, with the mask, uh, the painted uh, funerary mask. You can't see much of it on the ground, um, so it was very, very badly um, uh, degraded. Uh, but you'll see here, it's a type of coffin that fits very much into a kind of late Ramesside uh, iconography. Um, Interestingly, uh, I mean, it kind of looks like a woman with the earrings. The face is painted red, which might make you think it's a, it's a male burial. The individual inside was a woman. Um, you do sometimes get male, co uh, sorry, female coffins with a red face. And this individual was buried with some nice jasper hair rings, uh, uh, a bronze mirror, and a, a fairly typical set uh, of pottery. The challenge we face in all these graves is they're being used over several generations. And what they do is they come along and they pick up the bodies that are in the way and they put them at the back of the chamber. And so we've got a big problem of commingling. So at least half of our bodies are, um, we can't say, assign bones to individual bodies because all the bones have been, have been mixed up. We do know sometimes the, the, the removal of those bones has been happening uh, when, the, when the body was still, you know, there was still flesh on it uh, because the bones are still in, in articulation. Um, so these are probably family vaults that are being reopened and reused uh, over time. Um, and some of them are reused right down into the 9th and 8th century BC, which is one of our big conundrums. Um, so the architecture and the objects in the town stop. In the, in the cemetery, they're burying people uh, for a couple of hundred years later. I don't know at the present. Moving to the other cemetery, we have similar chamber tombs. So this is an example of two chamber tombs. And you can see the kind of skeletal, commingled mess uh, that our bioarchaeologists have to deal with. The erosion here is very severe, so we don't know what the superstructures look like. Um, that's a challenge for a bioarchaeologist. Um, but one of our most exciting tombs was found two years ago. On the surface, this is a, a tumulus, so very, very Nubian. Underneath, it's Egyptian chamber tomb of the, fine, of the type you find at many of these sites. Um, unusually here, though, um, it has five distinct chambers, so not just one on either side. So it's a very big tomb, our largest tomb uh, to date. And so whoever was building this, building it for the first burials there, wanted it to be a, a Nubian cultural, uh, sorry, Nubian monument on the surface. But inside, as I said, the architecture is very Egyptian, um, but the objects are as well. So we found a series of nice faience vessels, uh, the pottery vessels, very typical of the early 20th dynasty, uh, scarabs, hair rings, amulets, uh, headrests, as you can see, a comb there. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's just very interesting. We're right in the early 20th dynasty here, and there's this difference in, 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 in kind of cultural affiliation above ground and below ground. Um, as we move beyond the end of the New Kingdom, a new type of tomb is introduced. These are niche tombs, generally with uh, uh, a small um, tumulus or mound on the top, and then a small shaft with a, a little niche at the end in which uh, a burial is placed. Um, and this is reviving a type of tomb that had long been in use in Nubia. Um, but again, they're using Egyptian-style coffins, sometimes combining a Nubian funerary bed with an Egyptian-style coffin. Um, this wonderful ivory amulet of Bess that seems to have been reused and repurposed. Um, uh, we've only found one parallel for this so far, uh, which was in a private collection and dated to the pre-dynastic period. I'm sure this is not pre-dynastic. Um, but again, is it reflecting a more Nubian cultural milieu, uh, the appearance of this, this Bess? We move towards the end of the New Kingdom. You all know about the instability at the end of the New Kingdom, what was going on at Thebes and so on. Um, the assumption is being that these towns were simply abandoned. Um, so that you have, this, uh, you have this model of the loss of Egyptian control, and then everyone leaves. And there was almost an implicit suggestion that everyone left and went back to Egypt. But 
we started wondering about this. I mean, uh, the people there aren't necessarily Egyptians. They've been living there for generations. And in fact, there have been entanglements between Egyptians and Nubians in this area for five centuries and, of course, millennia before. Why would they necessarily leave? We have a very good example at Buhen in the Second Intermediate Period where people stayed on uh, under the ruler of Kush, uh, so reporting to a different ruler. Um, but if it's a viable place to live in terms of agriculture and environment, um, would you necessarily leave just because the, 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 the kind of royal support or the state support ha had ended? So we've, we're starting to question this, and we're doing that in a couple of different ways. One of them uh, is looking at the natural environment. Um, so as, as I said, there was a river, uh, river channel around this side of the site. It was once an island. Um, we've been doing ground penetrating radar with colleagues from British School in Rome, uh, University of Southampton. And what you're looking at here on this kind of fuzzy uh, plot is you're looking at the layers of silt that have built up in the channel. So this, we're doing this to get the shape of the channel uh, in ancient times. And then what we do is we marry that up to hard analysis that give us absolute dates, independent of the chronology of pottery or pharaohs or anything like that. So again, thanks to the generosity of our colleagues in Sudan, we can export samples. So we've been working with Jamie Woodward from the University of Manchester and Mark Macklin from Aberystwyth in, in Wales, who are geographers uh, who specialize in the long history of the Nile. And what they've been doing is we've been digging very, very deep trenches um, through the deposits in the dried up river channel. And what you're looking at here is the silt, the Nile mud that has been laid while the river was flowing. Then the river stops flowing, and you get a, a buildup of windblown sand, this very fine, pure yellow sand with nothing, no cultural or anthropogenic material in it. The river is then reactivated for a short time, and then you find another episode of sand, another activation of the river, and so on. And we've got a sequence of this uh, going through several centuries. What we do then, or what Mark and Jamie do, is they take samples of the sand and look at the luminescence values of the sand. Uh, when the sand is buried, its luminescence starts to, to fade off. So they use a technique called optically stimulated luminescence dating. It has an error, sometimes hundreds of years. It depends how old the dates are and so on. And so what you can see here um, is, for instance, the, the layer in the middle, this one here, we have a date of around 970 B 917 BC, so about a century after the end of the New Kingdom for that sand. We then take carbon-14 dates from charcoal that's fallen down into the river from the, from, the, from the town. And that provides us with two independent dates. And what we're beginning to find is that the, the river seems to be flowing um, during the period when the town was founded. But very shortly afterwards, probably within the 19th dynasty, there seems to be a relatively catastrophic failure of the Nile and a long interval where there's windblown sand accumulating in the channel. Um, Mark and Jamie often say that you know, maybe it was a very bad idea to found Amara West on this island because it seems that within a generation or two, it was becoming a very unpleasant place to live. The, town, the, the river then seems to reactivate and finally starts to dry out forever uh, in around 900 BC. Um, we do have some later floods, but they seem to be single events. So when you have a very large Nile flood, um, you get water coming down this channel. Um, so that's the kind of the, 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 the sedimentary evidence, as it were. But what's really interesting is we're finding evidence of how this was affecting people in the town. Um, I should just say what, what we think is happening when the, when the Nile dries out. So this is the island we live in, uh, live on, and there's a small channel around the side. What does that channel do? That channel allows vegetation to grow on both sides, particularly these tamarisk uh, trees that are sat within sand dunes. They stop the sand, the, 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 the tamarisk, but also the, the water body, of course, stop the sand coming onto the island. Once that channel fails, it's not going to be long before you end up in the situation we're in today. So what we're working on now is the hypothesis that Amara West was not abandoned because Pharaoh lost control of the area, but Amara West was abandoned because it became a very, very difficult place to live. And in fact, from about the 7th century onwards, all human settlement is on the other side of the Nile where there's protection from, those, from that wind and sand. Um, but yeah, as I said, we're, we're getting evidence of people responding to this in the town. So in our later architectural layers, we're finding consistently people are putting things outside their doors to block the, the, the buildup of sediments in the street. Now, you'll know how archaeological sites form, you know, tells or comms. They build up over time with layers and layers of architecture and rubbish and so on. Um, is the material in the street just rubbish? Well, interestingly, 
uh, we've been able to prove that sand was becoming an increasing problem. So this is just three examples of these blockings. But uh, a colleague of ours, Matt Dalton, who's uh, working at the University of Cambridge, he's uh, doing micromorphological analysis of our floor deposits and our street deposits. So this is taking samples of about 12 centimeters square, impregnating them in resin, uh, cutting a slice that's several microns thick, looking at it under the microscope, and you can start to see things that the naked eye can't. You can see water falling on surfaces. You can see animal dung. You can see individual layers of, of clay being added to refurbish a floor, and so on. Interestingly, in the street, uh, in one of the streets we've dug, what Matt's found is you've got a big change. In the, in the lowest layers, the, um, uh, the deposits are mostly very fine silt that has been probably created by the erosion of mud brick buildings and all the kind of dirt you get swirling around these mud brick villages. Once you get into the later layers, mid to late 20th dynasty, most of what's building up in the street and what people are building those blocking doors for is sand, windblown sand, uh, that you can see on the right-hand side uh, of the micrograph there. So there's a lot more to research to do here, but I think you, you get a sense that we're building up a picture that climate change and the difficulty of living here uh, was something that was uh, perhaps playing a very significant factor uh, in the abandonment of the town. I don't think we have to choose one factor over another, but I, I think we, it's probably the most significant factor. And we're then seeing that reflected in the bodies. So uh, Michaela's work on the post-New Kingdom uh, bodies is showing uh, people weren't living as long, they were, uh, they were suffering from more respiratory diseases, you think of the sand in the air and so on, um, and we're also finding that there's more stress markers on their body, there's more degenerative joint diseases, where they're working harder to keep up the same kind of agricultural output. So it's all about bringing a whole series of strands together to build up a picture of of how people lived in the town and how that changed over time and ultimately became too difficult to, to, to continue uh, living there. So it just reminds, uh, remains for me to, 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 to underline that this is obviously a collaborative effort, um, both all of our colleagues who worked on site but also all the scientists that analyze things when we get back to the lab. Um, and it's a very international team. We had uh, 11 different nationalities at Mara West last year, uh, and of course, not least, our, our Sudanese colleagues. Um, and of course, I, I can't um, omit mentioning of those bodies that fund us, particularly the um, Qatar Sudan uh, Archaeological Project. So, thank you very much. Town and also, well, methodological lecture that you gave us, uh, teaching us how you can use archaeological evidence either to prove or question things that maybe we're not able to answer. I have a question right away, and, uh, and then I give the floor to others. Um, of course, you were remarking that uh, people are not bots, and, uh, which is very true, of course. And, but there is this huge questions about Egyptian nation of Nubian living together with. Um, Egyptians, and I'm thinking about the research which has been carried out in Ascot uh, in doing residue analysis mm -hmm. of food. Are you planning on doing that? Are you doing that? Do you have any results on that? Yeah, so um, that was one of uh, Stuart Tyson Smith's work at Ascot, uh, or on the Ascot materials, very exciting. And um, one of the first things we did was we brought lots of fragments of cooking pots back to London. Um, uh, so some of our scientists at the British Museum did residue analysis, and we're looking at, we have Nubian cooking pots and Egyptian cooking pots, and we're looking at either different kind of fatty residues, yeah. or are they going to be different? We couldn't find traces of anything. And it's interesting, our, our scientists were saying the problem is because of the aridity, um, you don't get the good preservation of fatty acids. Um, and it's not widely known because when people do research like that and find out nothing, they don't publish it. So you don't have the kind of methodological basis. And it, it seems to be a problem at the site. We don't get preservation of, uh, of those kind of organics. So. Well, very yeah. interesting to know. Just before I was coming here, when I was working in Leiden, I was uh, going to start a research of a neuritic uh, village of Shokan, which the Museum of Leiden has excavated. And we have more than 1,500 pots in the Museum of Leiden. And we, of course, pots have been washed and rewashed in various periods and uh, restored. But still, we're starting with some residue okay. analysis yeah. and uh, hoping to find results. But yeah. I don't know yet what they'll find out. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. Well, I look forward to other people might have better questions. How much?
I had the impression that most vessels which you showed the shirts were just Egyptian, except for these three wonderful middle camera pieces, yeah. one even with uh, some decoration yeah. of the rim. Is there any later camera where uh, found in this? Uh, we, um, yeah, sorry, I, I, what I didn't I had to choose slides, obviously, is um, we, what's very common in the town are Nubian cooking pots. So these are uh, restricted vessels, handmade, often with basket impressions on the outside. Um, and they sometimes are 1% of an assemblage, sometimes up to 10%, depending on the house and, and the room. We have very little fineware. Uh, very little, a, a very small number of shards uh, in the in the town. Um, so, and, and the question about those new being cooking pots is, of course, they're very common at places like Elefantina as well. So they don't necessarily speak to Nubians living there. Um, with uh, with the fine ware, we do get a little bit more in the cemetery, um, and particularly with child burials, we get small uh, miniature fine ware vessels in, in kind of Nubian style. On the whole, in the town, it's cooking pots. Um, so. Um, I, I think they were at the river. Um, they, uh, there's, no, um, there's, there's no toilets uh, in any of the houses at Amara West, except in the deputy's residence, where there's a room excavated by the EES, uh, which has a, it actually had a basin with a, a pot set in the floor next to it. Uh, but in none of our small houses or the villas is there anything that's obviously a bathroom, I mean, unless they were using portable uh, things. Um, it's perhaps worth mentioning that you know, in, we're, we're doing quite a lot of anthropological and ethnographic work on, um, on the local villages, not because they're the same, but they're using a lot of the same materials, so it's informative. Um, and just as an example, a lot of the houses until recently um, had a shower room, but not a WC. And so that was the river and the fields and, and so on. So, um, but yeah, it's only in the deputy's house. But isn't it strange to have your, your living room with a reception and the master yeah. The yeah, it's very different from a. It's very different from a really yeah. Yeah, it's very different. Yeah, it's it's very different from a marna where you tend to have the master room in the middle yeah. and then rooms around it. Um, and the kitchen is um, in some cases, so the the, the when we did the three D fly through, that the kitchen was uh, just next to the front door. But in other houses, it's right in, you know, you have to go through the house to get to it. And what's interesting is often the kitchens, uh, or uh, by which I mean the rooms with these bread ovens, um, often they're roofed and quite heavily roofed. And one of the things we were wondering about with, say, the, the, the possible case of lung cancer, but particularly the respiratory disease, is are people in these rooms with smoke swirling around them? And you know, so it, yeah. it's, it's not logical to us, but it seems very consistent there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. The, uh, well, here, here, the cooking seems to be inside. So. Yeah. Um, but congratulations for your anthropologist farm. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. I, th I, I think there was one other one found in Nubia and Sesebi, but it's uh, not in context. Yeah. So it's it's very nice. Like most of them, as you know, it doesn't have a name on or anything. Um, so, but no, it's very nice. I think it's quite common in, in, in chamber tombs that they're used over a period of time and there's a, there's a recycling of the tomb and as we know there's a recycling of coffins and so on. Um, so unfortunately in, in the situation we're in it's very different, difficult to reconstruct an exact chain of events. You, you saw the mess some of those chambers present us. So you've got bones everywhere but often at the back as well and then you've got coffins and objects which might largely relate to the last burials but of course could be reusing earlier elements. It's, it's very difficult to unpick it 
We had one niche burial where we had, I think it was four individuals buried in the same coffin. Um, so how did that work? You know, had, had one of them become skeletonized or not? And you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of questions. But I think the, the idea of, of tombs that are being used over a long period of time is something you find in Egypt uh, yeah. as well. The idea that the same family is disposing of human remains in that way, that is that reusal of somebody else's burial, yes. But uh, in a family burial, one would expect a different yeah, uh, uh, consideration for the... Well, of course, we can't prove their families, um, but I, I think it's a possibility. Yeah, thank you. But you have it uh, well in Egypt as well. Uh, I was thinking of the work that uh, the Bali Museum is doing in Saqqara when in 1994 the tomb shaft of Eurus was found, which of course John Taylor uh, yeah. studied. Well, you know, the whole... Uh, there is no agreement on the dating of that death, but that, well, it's thought... Well, you can't be sure whether it is a family, but it's sort of thought to be a close community, and there is all changes of well, not only reused, but taking out the bodies from the coffins and having the coffins instead of used again and then put aside and it looks like a mess, but not a mess made by plunder. No, no, yeah. no, no. I mean, the other thing, uh, the other aspect of reuse we have is in the town where people are reusing uh, door jams and inscriptions. And we have some nice cases where they've used, reused the door jam upside down. So they don't care about the inscription. They want the piece of stone. So. Rita? Just a quick No, so the individuals do seem to have been tightly wrapped. Um, so we've got uh, very fragmentary evidence of, of, of linen and so on around the bodies. Um, also, the, the position of the bones suggests the tight wrapping of the body. You know, the hands are, 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 are very close to the side. Um, I don't recall if we've got any evidence of the, the piercing of the, of, of the, the bone to, have, to give access to the brain. Um, and, of course, we don't know if there's actually the full mummification treatment. We've no, no evidence jars. of that. No, so no canopic jars, just one shabti. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I should also say, as well as wooden coffins, we've got these kind of bark coffins. Um, so using the outside or bark containers, using the outside of uh, you know of trees uh, and creating a kind of simpler coffin. So we have a, a lot of that going on as well. Um, you can see the preservation is is very bad in terms of the the wooden objects. Um, so and liner. sorry. And liner also. Yes, yeah, we, we, we do have some textile survives, but, uh, but, but not much. Um, you know, it's small, small fragments. Well, thank you again, Neil, for thank your you. lectures. In Too long, was no. it? Yeah.